what I'm going to be telling you about today is a program that we developed, a uh, behavioral intervention program for the inattentive type of ADHD. Uh, and uh, just kind of gives you a little bit of an overview of what we're going to do. And I'm going to um, first talk to you a little bit about the key features, functional impairment of the inattentive type, and how it might be a little different from the combined type of ADHD. And then walk through the uh, intervention that we developed, uh, including the rationale and the content and some outcomes uh, from a couple of RCTs that we've done uh, and that we're continuing to analyze. Okay, let's talk first a little bit about what it's like in families who have children with ADHD and attentive type. And if any of your parents, some of these features will seem kind of like, yep, isn't that kind of what we are having to deal with as parents in terms of trying to um, motivate kids to uh, do what they're supposed to do, do their homework, clean their room, all sorts of things, and not procrastinate. Um, and what we see in families with the inattentive type um, is that these are so much more of a struggle. Uh, so we see that homework um, is probably one of the more common problems in just sort of getting through and organizing the loads of homework that might come home. Uh, and that routine activities are problematic. A lot of the times the parents have kind of given up in terms of getting kids to do things on their own. And so things go undone. In addition, um, what, what we see is there's lots of dawdling and procrastination, and, and overall, it's not a, the result of a, an ability problem. That's what we see. It's more of this kind of adaptive functioning and level of independence is lower than we might expect for somebody of that, um, of that age and ability level. What about at school? This is often the setting where these kids have their most challenging um, you know, kind of circumstances. And you can see here, you get a lot of daydreaming, um, you get a lot of spacing out, uh, just not tuning in and completing work. And it's here that these problems are often go unrecognized. And lots of teachers um, and some parents, too, consider this more of a problem of low motivation. Oh, he's just not motivated. Um, or he just can't do it, uh, and, and it's not really a consideration that there might be, be something um, going on in terms of attention that's making it difficult. Uh, the kinds of problems cut across the domains of school, so whether it's doing independent work, participating in group work activities, um, just getting started on things, finishing things, taking the right homework home, you know, making sure to take the assignment book home, the backpack, et cetera. All of it sort of becomes a, a rigmarole for a lot of these kids. Uh, and it can be very frustrating uh, to teachers. So how do we know when this sort of, you know, scenario that sometimes can be part of what a lot of kids go through. How do we know that it rises to the level of a disorder? And what we do to figure that out is um, rely on the guidance of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's version 5 now. And these are the criteria for ADHD and attentive type uh, presentation. Uh, and so basically, they're grouped into two categories of attention problems and hyperactivity impulsivity symptoms. And we're looking for problems that occur often and cause impairment um, in, that in, in, one or in the inattentive domain. And so we're looking for six or more of those kinds of problems in that list um, that are occurring often and causing impairment across situations. And we're looking for fewer than five uh, or fewer than six in the hyperactivity impulsivity list. Uh, that defines the inattentive type, whereas, of course, the combined type includes both symptom domains. Uh, and what you can tell from this in terms of how uh, the definition is currently set up is you get a fair amount of heterogene uh, heterogeneity in this group uh, so that you get some kids who have zero hyperactivity impulsivity symptoms and lots of inattention, uh, so they might even be underactive. Uh, and then you get some kids who are primarily in, inattentive, but they might have up to five of these hyperactivity impulsivity symptoms. So they look a little bit more like the combined type. So it's a little, it's a little tricky um, because you get this kind of heterogeneity. Um, but even so, we can see from lots of studies over the years that there are really clear differences, even using this cutoff, between um, the features of inattentive type and combined type. But 
but not in every domain. So let me tell you a little bit about that. Uh, so first of all, I've mentioned in terms of the inattentive and combined type, um, the inattention symptom list is the same for both types. Uh, the differences really come up in terms of um, the hyperactivity impulsivity um, domain. So let's talk about one thing that might be specific to more of a concern, let's say, for uh, inattentive type, and that's something called sluggish cognitive tempo. And here, these are kids that are having trouble with alertness and daydreaming and sluggishness, and um, they might be easily confused, slow moving, and certainly not what you think about when you think about hyperactive kids. Uh, and in fact, more of these symptoms are found in the inattentive group than in the combined group. Um, however, more of these problems are found in the internalizing group um, as well. So kids who have anxiety or depression, sometimes they have these features too. Um, so we're currently at the sort of the stage, it's kind of a hot topic for research at the moment, um, this sluggish cognitive tempo. And people are trying to figure out, is this part of an attentive type? Is this really a separate disorder? Is this something that transcends disorders and is kind of like a process? Um, but sort of regardless where that ends up, what we know so far is that for the inattentive type, uh, that having those kind of characteristics along with that group of nine symptoms I showed you earlier um, leads to even greater impairment. Um, so you get more social withdrawal, you get more academic performance problems, and so on. Okay, let's talk about something else that people talk, uh, think about with ADHD, and that's executive functioning deficits. So. Um, Really, there, there are fewer differences across the types when it comes to these kind of problems. And the, what are EF deficits? These are difficulty with planning, difficulty with organizing things, difficulty prioritizing, juggling, time management, all of this stuff. So you see from our little photo, a lot of people think about this as the director, the director of the orchestra. And so I have a little X because he's missing, right? Um, those are the kind of deficits that are really important because they kind of keep all the other um, functioning together. Um, but for kids with ADHD and inattentive type included, um, these are problematic. So things, they, kids might have the ability to f do their math problems. They might have the ability to do lots of things, um, but they just can't um, get organized sufficiently to make it all happen. Uh, and EF deficits become more pronounced as work becomes more complex, right? So as kids get older, this becomes even more of an issue. Uh, and another thing that arises for kids with inattentive type is that they're slower in processing, so it takes them longer to get through their work. Uh, and particularly with sort of perceptual motor tasks, writing tasks, things that require some speed as well. Um, when we compare these kids with uh, even combined type kids, they're slower in getting through the same amount of problems. So the demographic characteristics, what do we see? For inattentive type, there's some estimates out there, maybe 7% of the population, and you, you see the higher numbers when you sample from the uh, schools than when you sample from the clinics. Uh, and, and, and so you see that ratio of inattentive type is actually the more prevalent presentation of ADHD compared to the combined type. Um, but fewer of them come to the clinic. So what does that mean? What's happening? They're, they're being under-referred, right? So they're, they're kind of this um, unidentified um, problem out there um, that are not managing to get services for their problems. Um, and in fact, that's exactly what, what we see happening. This group historically has received far less treatment than kids with combined type. Uh, and uh, the age of referral reflects, reflects that as well um, because the inattentive type are referred for services when they are referred at older ages as compared to combined type was caught pretty early. Not a big surprise because the um, kids who are hyperactive are pretty noticeable to people and they disrupt people and they annoy people and all sorts of things. Whereas the inattentive type kids tend not to be that way. They kind of sit in their own little spot and sort of, you know, are inattentive and spacey, but not really creating as many problems for other people. So they can be truly overlooked. Uh, in terms of a gender ratio, we still see more boys than girls in the inattentive um, group. Um, but that ratio is um, a little bit uh, smaller for the inattentive type. Uh, 
And this slide really talks about the, the comorbidity. So what other disorders go along with ADHD and attentive type? And we see the full range, um, but, but somewhat fewer problems of aggression, opposition, conduct as compared to combined type. That's where you really see the difference. Otherwise, you tend to see similar rates of anxiety, depression, and learning disabilities, which are pretty common. You can see by the um, percentages next to these areas. Academic uh, impairment is pervasive, and um, we even have now some pretty, you know, good longitudinal studies to suggest that it's these early inattention problems that lead to the ac poor academic outcomes that we're seeing. So the, the more difficulty with inattention, the poorer the education outcome over time. And, and we see it both in terms of academic underachievement, so they're not doing well on those standardized tests or as well as they could be. Um, they're not producing work, and um, they have problems with organization and study skills, things that we call academic enablers. So that's the academic, the, so, the domain. What about the social domain? Here we actually see even more difference from combined type because these kids tend to be more passive and withdrawn. So out on the playground when they've done some studies looking at this, these kids tend to s sort of float around the peripheral of the, uh, the periphery of the pr playground. They're not as engaged. They play more by themselves. Um, there's less tuned into group conversations. Um, I had a student one time set up a little chat room years ago um, and did a study comparing the different types and um, how much they participated in the chat room and could they remember um, what the other uh, members of the chat room would, would be saying and, and, and there really were differences in that the inattentive type the inattentive type had poor memory for what was going on. They didn't participate as much, whereas a combined type would make more hostile comments, which I thought was kind of interesting. Inattentive did not do that. So the inattentive group is, is not as well accepted by peers. You know, they're, again, kind of overlooked. Um, and the thinking is that they have both knowledge and performance deficits. So not only are they not doing um, sort of effective social behaviors, meeting and greeting people and things like that, um, but they also don't know what to do. Whereas uh, with a combined type, sometimes people think, well, they kind of know what to do, um, but they're just so impulsive that they can't stop themselves from doing the wrong thing. Uh, here, this is a little bit different. And. Um, there's some, also some research to show that these kids might be a little bit less motivated to do, to sort of barrel on through challenging or tedious tasks. They might be more easily discouraged, more passive, and so on. What about parenting kids with these kinds of issues? Well, it's stressful and exhausting to kind of stay up with it um, and try to provide the scaffolding necessary to make sure that all the little tasks of the day are done. Uh, and particularly for parents who have their own concerns around inattention or depression and so on, it's, it's troublesome. And we also kind of see this bi-directional relationship, which we've also been able to evaluate a little bit in our um, uh, sample of kids with ADHD and attentive type, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, but here what we're finding is that all these attention symptoms, which we talked about, okay, they lead to these impairments over here, getting homework done, social impairments, um, home impairment, which is basically not following routines and so on. Uh, they have a direct relationship. However, when you insert negative parenting in these models, negative parenting meaning inconsistent parenting, um, ineffective parenting, that serves as a, as a partial mediator for the relationship between inattention and these types of impairment, which means that parenting is playing a role, okay? It might not be causing the attention problems, but it can exacerbate what's there. Uh, so that gives us some um, good, you know, sort of reasoning for why we wanted to make sure in our treatment we develop a program that involves parents. Okay, so now into the treatment domain. What was going on in the early 2000s for, in, for ADHD was really a lot of studies looking at combined type, but there really were not any looking at inattentive type. And our thinking was that the types of behavioral interventions that have been developed for combined type may not be optimal um, based on all these kind of differences that we just talked about. Uh, and there was only one study, it wasn't designed for an attentive type, but it was sort of an interesting finding that they did this uh, social skills training study with a broad group of kids with ADHD, some of whom had combined type, some of whom had an attentive type. 
and found that it was the kids with the inattentive type were the ones that showed the greatest improvement on parent and child reported assertion, which is interesting. It kind of fits right in with what we're seeing with this group, that they're kind of less assertive, uh, uh, less likely to speak up, uh, and here this intervention was showing well, maybe it will help that, that particular problem. So let's talk more about why specialized training for ADHDI. Our existing treatments were geared more for combined type, and we talk about the existing treatments, what's out there, their parent training interventions, um, and they tend to focus on these, you know, aggression defiance behaviors or um, how to yield compliance. And, and really, when we talked to parents, what were their primary concerns? It was this dawdling, not doing their homework, and, and they really weren't doing things independently. And what about social skills training? Well, most of the existing social skills programs were designed for kids that are rejected and acting out, um, whereas the group of kids with inattentive type were more passive, socially isolated, and really it was kind of this neglect was more of the problem. And in terms of school-based interventions, they tended to focus on the off-task disruptive behavior, not so much on the slow cognitive processing and underproductivity, which is more of the problem for the inattentive type. So that was kind of the lead up to um, our program, why we developed the Child Life and Attention Skills Program, which we call CLASS. And so we started back in 2002 with a grant from NIMH to develop this program for the inattentive type, and then proceeded on from there. Uh, and I'll, um, the, the program itself is kind of a combination of what we knew worked with combined type, but adaptations of all of those pieces. So parent training, a school-based intervention, child skills training. So what was novel about this were all the things that we needed to do to make this fit more with the kinds of problems that the inattentive type kids were bringing, um, bringing to us. And so we made sure that we had this program designed to meet their various areas of impairment. We included lots of cues and prompts and routines and accommodations to try to scaffold those uh, executive function deficits and slow processing that we talked about. We made sure to include child groups to teach the skills for that might be helpful for executive functions, but also those social skills deficits we talked about, as well as provide the, the group we also see as having a very important function in providing support for the behavioral programs developed for home and school. Because we can get in there and motivate the kids to want to take part in these behavioral programs at home or at school. Uh, and that turns out to be what we, you know what one um, uh, function of the child group. Uh, in our um, program, there was a decreased emphasis on contingency management for impulsivity and defiance for obvious reasons. These are not big issues for these kids. Uh, and we try to maximize generalization across settings. Um, again, this has been an uh, ongoing sort of problem for ADHD treatments in general as you get the effect in the, treat in the situation that is being treated, but it doesn't generalize to school or to home or wherever else you're wanting to um, see the treatment um, have an impact. So we wanted to involve everybody in this kind of round-the-clock intervention, so involving school, involving home, and involving the kids. Um, lots of programs rely on parents and teachers to introduce the programs to the kids and then you know, try to get them to be motivated to take part in our program. The skill of the week would be taught in each of the child groups, and that would empower the kids to engage in the treatment in other settings. Um, and we also try to maximize the synergistic effects of the treatment by using the same terminology um, in our child groups, in our parent groups, and in our meetings with teachers, so that the kids were hearing how they were doing across these settings with the same language, using often the same target behaviors. Um, so that, that was very helpful. So here's kind of a little slide describing the various components. So you see the parent group. We did weekly parent groups, uh, eight to 10 weeks, 90 minutes. Um, and usually we had five to eight families per group. Uh, we had family meetings interspersed to try to tailor the program. So we had this group, and then they'd learn, a, you know, we have a very set curriculum, manualized treatment, and then um, they would have individual meetings inserted to help tailor the concepts to their individual families. Uh, and we had monthly boosters after that time period. 
for the child group, it met at the same time in a room that was, you know, a couple, a couple doors down. Uh, and uh, same 90 minute, eight to 10 weeks, um, and the kids also attended the, the, um, the uh, family meetings. And then we had a teacher component. And here, we would go out to the schools, uh, meet with the teachers. There's one orientation meeting, 30 minutes. And then we would meet with the teacher, with the parent, with the child, uh, up to five uh, additional 30-minute meetings to set up a behavioral program, um, some kind of accommodations in the classroom, and then follow that up each week. So that was kind of the general strategy. So the parent and child groups were all conducted in a clinic, uh, and the, um, we traveled to the school for the teacher meetings. So what does the treatment look like? So. Here are some ideas about the modules that we taught, the, some of the skills. And you can see how, you know, they, they really do map on to the impairments these kids have with a lot of effort on homework and study skills. We would do things um, teaching the kids how to organize backpack, teaching how the kids through um, different um, modules how to start and stop work, how to um, read their homework assignment page. Uh, uh, set up good morning routines, organization time tools, and in addition, we'd focus on French, friendship making, being a good sport, um, learning how to be assertive, accept consequences. So, accept when something doesn't go their way. That's a very popular um, target behavior, as it turns out, for parents, uh, and it was here. Um, problem solving, conversational skills and so on. So we had, you know, each week covered maybe two, three, sometimes up to, up to that number of modules. And we would structure it so that we'd have um, the kids review, you know, what happened that week? Did they practice their skills? Did they earn stars for their skills at home and at school? Because everyone knew what their target behaviors were. These were their target behaviors. And um, whatever it was, showing good accepting, did they do that at home this week? Did they do that at school this week? Did they earn stars for that? Because we had a behavioral program set up that would be designed for that, which you'll see examples of that in a little bit. Um, we had a skill of the week, as I mentioned, and lots of attention checks. I mean, you'd be surprised, even in these little groups, right, they're five to eight kids, um, you'd still get this drifting attention. Uh, and so, you know, we try to combat that um, by doing attention checks. So we would say, what was the last thing that I said? And they needed to respond what that was. Uh, and. And the surprising part is they had to be taught how to do that. Sometimes there's lots of drifting, uh, even in that small environment. But that was very helpful, I think, to get them to continue to pay attention and be involved with the group, along with fun activities, skill games, and lots of role plays, um, stations to practice their skills. Uh, and we had a reinforcement system in there. Let me show you what that look like. But th this is just, just to tell you there was a you know, predictable structure each week and it was integrated with the child parent group at the end. But let me show you some of the materials. So you can see we have you know, puppets and things that we use to present different characters like characters being assertive or characters being um, uh, aggressive or passive. Um, the lamb of course and guess what that one was. Uh, and we have the, a little box right that ba box in the bin is um, uh, shoot for the stars. And so when they would get an attention check correct, they got to throw the ball in the box. They loved it. I mean, you know, simple things like that to keep it lively and fun. Uh, and games and things that we would play. Uh, you'll see some other examples here. So this is um, an example of what one of the behavior charts might look like. Um, so all the kids would start on green patrol, and they would stay there unless they weren't participating or had behavior to deal with, and then their little um, clothespin would move down the line. Um, very rarely did kids ever drop into a yellow patrol or a red patrol. If they stayed on green patrol during the whole group, then they would get a prize at the end. So that was our basic, pretty easy to use behavior program. But these were kids were not huge management issues either. Uh, we had group rules. We had three ways to earn stars in group, and one of the big ones is participation. Remember, these kids are not always in there participating because they may not know what's going on. Um, but so we target that, and they can earn stars for that. And then the attention checks defined there. Here's just an example of the messy clean backpack. So what we would do is um, that we'd have re relay races. They'd figure out, you know, why would the um, 
you know, what's the advantage of having an organized backpack? Well, you can find things. So we would do, set up little games and things where uh, they'd have little competitions who can find what and compare the messy versus the organized. They bring in their backpacks. We'd evaluate them, how organized or not. Um, those are the kinds of things. So here are the um, parent skills uh, and that we're teaching. And you know, we're focusing quite a lot on how to set up a good routine and plans at home. So things that you know, we think about muscle memory. I had a, at the time I developed this slide, my daughter was taking piano lessons, and it was all about muscle memory. And I thought, wow, that's exactly what this is about. It's just trying to make it automatic so you don't even have to think through the process. Um, and that's what this is. So morning and evening routines were set up, homework, um, play date plans, chores. Um, we focused on all those kind of practical um, areas that these kids tended to be having some difficulty with. Uh, we talked about um, how to, you know, use positive communication, using, you know, attending skills, saying positive things, how to use praise in a specific way to actually increase target behavior and not just make people feel good. Uh, using quality time, uh, and then setting up these sort of more powerful reward programs to support daily living skills. So we did this home and classroom challenge, and I'll show you an example in a minute. We also taught parents how to give effective directions, and that's usually a component of most parent training programs. Um, but then in addition, we taught about, you know, spent some time talking about time management, organizing the house, trying to clean it up a little bit. Uh, using discipline was not as much of a focus um, since we didn't have a really you know um, defiant group here, uh, but really still had to had to implement that in a way that would be effective. And then the parents were always taught about the skill of the week, so they were taught what was the social skill that was being worked on, what were the independent skills that were being worked on, uh, and then we worked with parents in how to collaborate with teachers. Uh, and, you know, because sometimes the parent-teacher relationships are pretty strained at that point. Um, and, and so we kind of work through how to get through meetings with teachers and be able to work more as a team. And then we also had a little bit of a, a uh, we had a component on parent stress and cognition management. So that was kind of like our CBT piece. Uh, and um, some of the parents really like this and took off on it, so we've kept it in. But it's uh, basically uh, some of our parents would get themselves into these think this thinking of, you know, catastrophizing these little things that would go on. And so they'd be having these um, thoughts, you know, kind of ruminating going on about how this means that, you know, their child's never going to be successful or they're never going to have any friends or whatever it is. Uh, and so we would try to um, get them to rethink how they're talking to themselves about these problems and help the pro these areas seem sort of more manageable, not so overwhelming. Uh, and that was pretty helpful. Some of the target behaviors that we worked on at home included how to get through this um, morning routine. You've seen that. Uh, and the homework assignment independently, completing chores in the evening routine. And we, you know, kind of spell it out as we needed to with very specific examples. And they'd use a home challenge chart. And this, this is one thing that might have varied across families, um, depending upon what they were able to do, what the parents were able to do. Uh, and, and here's an example of one, you know, that's pretty actually for a parent who doesn't have huge ADHD concerns themselves, um, that they can track um, the various um, routine activities of the day and the social skills. And, and so you can see each day there'd be a total. And there's a little row there that um, is classroom challenge. And so some families could, um, they, they had the classroom challenge going on, they would add in how many points were earned at home each day, or at school each day to their home challenge, and that, that would tabulate into their daily total and for a, a home-based reward, uh, and maybe a, a weekly total for a um, weekly home-based reward. Um, so this, was, this is where we did a lot of, you know, had some variability in what, what the programs looked like. Sometimes it was just one target behavior a day, that was it. Um, and sometimes it was even more complicated, so, um, so that was fine. This is the teacher component. Uh, and here, uh, we involve all of the teachers were involved. We didn't have any teachers decline. Uh, and we included in the teacher component an orientation meeting. It was about 30 minutes, went over the program, went over ADHD and attentive type, and various accommodations and interventions. And then, um, and then we would spend four or five meetings meeting with the teacher, the therapist, the family, and focus on developing a good homework plan. Uh, the classroom challenge and talk about accommodations. 
So for, for a homework plan, you know, sometimes the, the homework uh, assignments were pretty um, random and unclear, uh, and so we tried to make sure that it was, you know, clear postings each day or some kind of a homework sheet uh, that was really clear what the teacher's expectations would be uh, and that maybe there would uh, be a, an accommodation made to homework in terms of the amount of homework assigned. It might be reduced or um, some other type of accommodation. So this was all kind of tailored depending upon the circumstance of the class classroom and teacher and student. Uh, and we would set up a classroom challenge binder for every student. So this was standard. Uh, so they had these little notebooks. Um, and within the notebook was a daily, kind of like a daily report card, if you've ever heard of those. Um, and, what, and I'll show you a closer. But, they t but this, this um, binder, they'd carry to and from school, or some version of that. Uh, and this is what those pages inside might look like. Here's an example uh, where we have the target behavior listed that um, we de uh, decided upon with the teacher uh, and wrote it in. And then they would be rated um, several, you know, three times a day, uh, either you know needs improvement, okay, or super job, zero, one, or two. And then they could get bonuses for remembering to take the challenge home. Uh, they could get bonuses for the teacher and child matching their scores. So we try to be training kids how to evaluate their own behavior. Uh, and so they'd give themselves ratings. And if it matched the teachers, then they get a bonus point. Uh, so this would go back and forth every day. Uh, and so we could sort of track their progress over time. And you can see that the target behaviors are very specific uh, and defined so that everyone knew what was required to meet or not that child target behavior. And here are other things. We had them in separate domains, you know, whether it's an academic or study habit target behavior or social target or rules or behavior. Um, you know, we, we actually would enter these meetings with teachers with lists of potential target behaviors, and they would kind of go down their list and think about the student and think, well, what, what would be most fitting and most important to work on? Uh, and then parents would come up with rewards at home, and both daily and weekly um, rewards are included. And, and the way we set it up is we didn't have the child have to decide, do I use my points on a daily and then not be able to use them on the weekly? Basically, you get both. Uh, so you get a daily reward, and then if you get enough dailies, then you get a weekly. So um, that, that seemed to be important with this group of kids. Uh, and the various tips for making these programs work um, is to make sure that the, the target behaviors are defined very specifically. Um, there was, and one example here is an organized desk. Um, one of the teachers I worked with early on when we were developing this program uh, you know, was reporting back. Um, we were talking over the phone. Well, he's really not earning his organized desk um, target behavior. And, you know, it was kind of like, well, why? We talked more about it. Well, does he really know what he's supposed to be doing? Well, I don't know. Well, how about showing him, you know, a, a desk that is organized that would be what he needs to accomplish to be organized? So uh, at that point, the teacher then went back, met with the student, described really clearly what organized meant. Uh, and that actually was um, sufficient to get him working. Working again. So sometimes it's kind of relatively what seems like small things, but they work um, quite well. And then the other um, item that often comes up is making sure that the teacher is prompting and using praise um, for target behaviors throughout the day, rather than just at the end of the day, oh, here's the notebook, and, and showing them how they did, having them um, break up the day by giving that more frequent feedback um, about their progress is really important. And at the parent side, we would go over guidelines for how do you check the, the, um, the class classroom challenge. So you have to check it every single day. You can't wait till the weekend. Um, you want to give praise for earning the stars. Want to be specific about what it was that they earned it for. Um, and if they had a bad day, not to argue, not to nag. You just won't go on to the next day. Uh, and then prompting the child to take the classroom challenge. And of course, give, earn, uh, providing whatever rewards were earned when they earn it. So that's kind of the uh, classroom challenge intervention. And then uh, depending upon the individual students, we'd go over these lists of accommodations um, that they can use. Um, and, and some of the teachers, this was all very tailored uh, to what seemed to work for that student, whether it was a uh, quiet area to work in the classroom or, you know, shortened work assignments or having reminders posted to their desktops, um, giving um, the kids cues to pay attention, 
physical, you know, physical cues or, or visual cues. Um, and yeah, quiet, steady carols. We had one girl who did prefer this and that she kind of ended up with a study carol that was kind of this antique desk that she loved to work in. And that worked really well for her and she could focus and stay on task more in that environment. Uh, so that's the overview of the intervention. And so here's some data that's now been published and I'll just walk you through our two trials that have been published. The, the first is a pilot trial that we ran uh, looking at a group of 66 kids and we randomized uh, half of them to get the treatment and the other two not. Um, it was kind of treatment as usual, all ages 7 to 11. We gathered measures before, after, and um, at follow-up. So um, our participant characteristics are here. Uh, you can kind of see more males than females, but not by a huge margin like you sometimes see with uh, hy the hyperactive samples. Uh, and you get some comorbid diagnoses, a little bit of oppositional defiant disorder in a quarter of the sample. Uh, and a lot of the kids were, our average achievement and IQ scores were very strongly in the average range. Um, so it was a um, uh, pretty strong sample there. The outcomes um, from this particular study um, showed that the intervention that I just described uh, led to statistically and clinically significant improvement in attention problems as rated by parents and teachers, organizational skills, and social skills. And what we found is that 55% um, of the treatment group were actually within the normal range at post-treatment versus 27 of the control group, 27%. Um, and you tend to see all groups kind of improve by the end of treatment, um, including your uh, control group. So, but that was a wide margin there, uh, and the gains were maintained at follow-up. So. This was quite encouraging, um, and when we looked at clinical global improvement, we found that parents and teachers rated all of the children in the treated group as at least slightly improved, um, whereas a third of the teachers and parents uh, in the control group uh, were unchanged or worse, high satisfaction. So this, that was the backdrop for our larger scale randomized trial that we completed while well, we ran between 2008 and 20. 13, um, and this was a two-site study, so we gathered half the sample at UCSF and the other half uh, at UC Berkeley, um, and Steve Hinshaw was sort of the uh, faculty at UC Berkeley overseeing that side of the study, uh, and this was a, so this was a five-year study, about uh, 199 kids were randomized, and for this larger scale trial, we looked at two control groups. We had our usual care group, but we also had a parent-focused training group. So that group got the parent intervention, but didn't get the child skills intervention, didn't get the um, school-based intervention. So we're looking at whether our integrated treatment was going to be superior to this um, uh, parent-focused approach. Uh, so it was an active treatment control. Um, we had lot broad recruitment. We recruited from everywhere in SF and in Berkeley and private public schools, et cetera. Uh, and we looked at um, durability into the following school year. We gathered lots of information, um, lots of outcome measures, and so we haven't sort of gone through all of these outcomes yet, and so I'll be presenting what we have so far today. Um, but we're actively engaged in analyzing data from this study to see what more we can learn. Uh, so as I said, the sample is 199 cases. Um, you get kind of the same profile, except here you notice our oppositional defiant disorder is way down. We only had 6% meeting criteria for a diagnosis. So this was a very pure, what I call pure ADHD inattentive type sample. Um, where that was really their leading concern coming into um, the study. Their academic impairment, um, was, yeah, there was a little bit of academic impairment, though, I'll notice. Particularly, you see math fluency was a little bit low. Um, these are not quite as strong scores as in the last um, uh, study we did, um, but still kind of mostly hovering in the average range. Very few are on medication at baseline. Some people are surprised by that, only 4.5%. But in this sample and in this age, it's not all that unusual, and particularly in the Bay Area, where you tend to see rates a little bit lower. Um, so, and, and for the most part, a lot of these kids, this was their first time ever evaluated for ADHD. Um, so they wouldn't have been, been on medication. We recruited most of our kids through schools, uh, so that was perhaps why. Um, fewer of the referrals were from psychiatry or um, pediatric offices. So we randomly assigned to the three groups, our class treatment, 
parent-focused treatment, treatment as usual. Uh, let's look at first our attendance, um, and we can see that the attendance is very high. Um, the parent group, 93% of the uh, uh, families participated in um, the parent group meetings, uh, and the family meetings averaged about 4.2 per family. They could vary, remember, between like four and even as high as six. The teacher meetings um, averaged around four. Uh, in our parent-focused um, intervention, parent group attendance was 88%, which is a little bit lower, um, but, uh, the, but still pretty good, and the um, parent meetings averaged about 3.9%. So let's look at outcomes, um, and what you'll see is a similar theme through all the outcome measures, which is kind of interesting. Uh, this is parent report of inattention symptoms gathered at baseline, that's the first point, post-treatment and follow-up. Uh, and so what you see at the bottom is a little table that gives you the effect size. So effect sizes um, about 0.5 and above are moderate. Um, 0.3 to 0.4 is a smaller effect. Um, but that's like how strong of an effect you're getting. And, it, and the little asterisk means that it was statistically significant. So that difference was larger than you would expect by chance. Um, and so what you see emerging from these um, out these slides, and this one in particular, is that the treatment, class treatment, outperformed usual care uh, both at post-treatment and at follow-up. However, the parents in the two treatment groups didn't report differences, um, but the parent group and the usual care um, did show a discrepancy in the small range. So this is the teacher report, same measure, just a rating of inattention symptoms, and that basically is how often do these nine inattention symptoms happen from never, sometimes, often, very often? And so what you see is a drop. And so uh, on the um, left side, you'll see those are the number of symptoms that are endorsed as occurring often or very often. I left that out of last time. Um, so from baseline to post-treatment, you see significant drops in the um, class group relative to both PFT and usual care. So the red line is significantly lower than both of the other two. Uh, and actually, it's a pretty strong effect size for the class relative to TAU and um, somewhat smaller for class and PFT. Uh, at follow-up, uh, there weren't any differences. Now, the, the follow-up measures for the teacher in the next school year were usually a different teacher. In fact, they always were a different teacher. And it's kind of at the beginning of the year. And so what you kind of see is this grouping together so they end up sort of at the same spot. Uh, and, you know, there's lots of reasons that might be happening. Maybe we gathered those too soon during the school year. Um, what's happening, it looks like, is that the usual care is getting better. Well, remember, these kind of inattentive kids can be kind of on the sidelines. So it's not clear that some of their behavior was noticeable at that point in time. Uh, but we could talk more about that later. The um, SCT symptoms, we also gathered SCT symptom data from parents and teachers and found a similar kind of thing. So the parent report, the, the treated group, outperformed usual care, um, and uh, the parent group also outperformed usual care for these symptoms. So we see significant drops in SCT, which just is about the same as we found for the attention symptoms. And that was true for the teacher report as well. But here, we get the teachers in the class group showing significantly greater improvement than um, uh, for PFT. Organizational skills um, improved over time. So um, with our treated group outperforming usual care and PFT, so parents reported better organizational skills after they got this treatment relative to both the other groups. And uh, the teacher also same kind of profile with the treated group, uh, the class showing gains relative to both the other control groups, which didn't differ. Okay, so then we looked at homework problems and study skills. Uh, we're also finding here that from baseline to post-treatment, the class group uh, was significantly, um, had significantly fewer homework problems from um, compared to the usual care and also compared to the PFT group. And the PFT group also had significantly fewer problems than usual care. Not a big surprise, we did cover homework problems in and how to set up good homework plans in the parent-focused treatment. Because remember, they got all the curriculum 
that the other the class got, the parent group got that too. So we would have expected some improvement there. Um, and the teachers, um, it was only the teachers in the class group, however, that reported improvement in study skills, which is the same as the kind of pattern we'd seen with the attention symptoms and SCT symptoms and so on. Then we looked at math achievement, and here we're looking at percentage of cases at or above the average range at the end of treatment, and what we found is that um, no real big difference between the class and PFT, both those treated groups, we didn't see much of a difference. So we combined those groups and then compared them to usual care, and it was in that comparison that we saw a significant difference. Um, so with the usual care showed a big drop in achievement at post-treatment relative to the two treated groups. Um, that was in math, that didn't happen in reading. Um, but we looked at these data and thought, well, I wonder why that's happening, and it could be, you know, speculate that it's the improvement in homework problems that, um, or reduction in homework problems that mediated that effect, and indeed that's what happened. Um, so, so what we found is that for both, when we combined the two treatments that got the parent intervention focused on homework, how to, you know, set up good homework plans and so on at home, that it was those cases um, where that was working, where the homework problems were reducing, that was those cases that had the, uh, maintained their uh, strong scores in math achievement over time. It was actually a full mediation model, so that was interesting. And a, and a real um, reinforcement to us about the importance of working on homework specifically and helping families set up homework, good homework plans uh, um, in, in our parent-focused intervention, as well as class, of course. Okay, what about social skills? We spent some time working on those, too. Uh, and so what we see here is improvement in parent-rated social skills for the class relative to usual care, uh, and as well um, improvement in teacher-rated um, social skills, both when class was compared to PFT as well as to usual care. Uh, and then if you kind of look at just kind of a way to look at some of the effects is you get the biggest change. So these are the percent of children no longer meeting criteria for ADHDI by parent or teacher report at post-treatment. So the largest number of those are the largest percentages in class. And then you get this mid-level through PFT, so you get some benefit but not um, as much. And then, you know, much less for uh, usual care when they're not getting that treatment. And the same sort of reverse profile for how much global improvement do you get? Well, you get um, the most global improvement. Here, lower scores are, are better. Um, so you get the most with class, which is about even for parents, uh, whether you're in class or PFT. Um, but when you're asking teachers about it, uh, you only get really improvement when teachers are also involved with the program. The, the teachers who were not involved in the program, i.e. those in the PFT group, did not report that level of improvement. Uh, and then just to kind of take a quick look at satisfaction, parents and um, you know, all, both of the groups um, were really satisfied with the program in terms of how helpful it was and all these things um, and general improvement. Uh, and interestingly, 85 and 79 percent would have preferred to have a child skills group or a, or a um, teacher component, school-based component, those in the PFT. So most of them really would have preferred having been randomized to that condition, but they didn't get that condition. Um, but still, they were very satisfied with the services that they got. Uh, the teachers were satisfied, even though you saw the work that they were doing. They were using the um, classroom challenge notebooks each day. They were attending these meetings and so on. Um, and they still felt pretty good about um, the program, probably because they saw the gains and improvements in their students. Okay, so briefly, again, to kind of review the R these latest RCT findings, is that we get the biggest effects when we compare our class program to usual care, and it occurs across the board for attention symptoms, SCT symptoms, organizational study and homework skills, social skills, and global improvement. Um, at, when we look at the effects of PFT, that's when we just work with the parents, we don't get the benefit of that intervention generalizing to the school context. And class even had some additional benefit relative to PFT in terms of greater improvements on attention, SCT, and impairments at school, right, uh, and homework and organizational skills at home. 
Uh, as far as at follow-up, we saw the parents would report some, main, uh, some improvement at follow-up compared to usual care. Um, however, teachers in the new school year didn't report um, differences between um, the groups. And improvement in math achievement was seen for children in both treatments and was fully mediated by improved homework skills. So what conclusions can we make? Um, that what we see from this, from our two trials, um, is uh, the, lots of um, support that psychosocial treatment can reduce attention problems and improve impairment for children with the inattentive type. But we think it's this integration of these interventions across parent, teacher, and child that appears most effective as compared to this kind of single component treatment. And we think it's because we're aligning the goals across the settings and programming for generalization. Uh, so at this point, what we're doing, of course, we're going to be analyzing many, you know, these data, finding out more um, information about how the program works. Um, but our um, also uh, initiatives to de develop methods to improve access sustainability and cost effectiveness. And one way we're trying to do this is through school implementation. So what we're trying to do at this point, or an effort we're making, is to try to adapt this program for implementation by school-based mental health so that they can run these groups at school sites um, with the parents, with the teachers, and um, with the students uh, to, to try to increase the access rather than having you know kids find their way to clinics, um, which is often much more difficult, um, creating an easier um, route for these interventions to be, um, to be delivered. Okay, and then of course this takes a lot of these are just a partial subset of kids that are the um, faculty as well as the um, project managers and clinicians who participated, but of course we, I give lots of credit to these folks who are, some of whom you saw on the screen because uh, they were a big part of making this program work. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, Fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.